most of you know that you have a spirit, but some of you might be here for the first time in these evening services. And you don't realize that your body is one part of you that you can see plainly, and you feed, and you, you give it drink, and you give it exercise. And inside, you have another part of you, the psychological part of you, that psychologists deal with and that you yourselves can deal with. And that psychological part of you is the part you know as your mind, that, that thinks about things, that works out equations, that considers uh, issues when you're buying a car or when you're voting for some politician. That's your mind. And then you have another part, a psychological part also, that is your emotions. And those are the things that feel happiness, uh, and they can sense strong desire at times, uh, and they can feel great affection for other people at times. And that's part of your psychological being too. And then inside your psychological part, you have a third important factor that is your will. That's the part of you that makes decisions, that produces action in you. And so most of us, I think, know about those two parts. And we've been taught often, oh yes, there's an outer part in a human being and there's an inner part. But do you realize that that's the tragedy with most of us in Christendom? Most of us have been brought up thinking that there are just two parts. And this has led to all kinds of confusion, really. Because it is in the third part that is inside both of those that God himself works in our lives. It's in our spirits that God works. But many of us who are Christians know little or nothing of our spirits. We've been brought up to think we're bodies, and if you don't mind using the word soul, because that's actually the word that the Bible uses to designate the psychological part of us. It might interest those of you who don't know to realize that the word psychology, psychology comes from psyche, which means soul in Greek, and logos, which is a way of thinking about your soul. And that's what the Bible calls the psychological part of you. In fact, there's one famous verse that many of us can just say very easily backwards, may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly and keep your spirit, the inside part of you, and your soul, the psychological part of you, and your body, whole and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And it's that verse, in fact, that we base our studies on during these evening services. It's 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, and it describes us as beings who exist on three different levels. Now, of course, many of us have heard that, but don't really take it too seriously. And so, when it comes to things that God does through our spirits, we immediately attribute those to our souls, and we get into incredible trouble. Now, I'll just show you one or two of these things, loved ones, and you'll see it. Maybe you would look at 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. For what person knows a man's thoughts except the spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now do you see those different ways of spelling spirit in those two verses? You see in verse 11, For what person knows a man's thoughts except the spirit with a small s? 
And in Greek, there is no article there. That is, the does not appear in Greek. Then do you see the last part of the verse 11, so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And that's a capital S. And in Greek, that has the article. And the Bible always makes a distinction between the Spirit of God and our spirits. And do you see what the Bible is saying? That the only way a person can know what God wants them to do in their life is that the Spirit of God inside him knows what he wants and communicates that to our little spirits. And that's how we know whom we should marry or what jobs we should take or where we should spend our lives. Now, of course, many of us don't really take that too seriously. And we attribute guidance not to our spirits, but to our souls. And so we end up in all kinds of contortions, trying to find guidance of God through the activity of our minds. And all of us here tonight know the frustration that we come into as we try to listen to this missionary and that missionary, this preacher and that preacher, and try to work out with our minds, what does God want us to do? Or we read all kinds of books, and we try to weigh one thing that one book says God would want us to do against another thing another book says He wants us to do, and we just come into confusion. Now, that's because, loved ones, we often look for guidance from God to our souls instead of realizing that the Holy Spirit gives that to our spirits. Now, we do have to do something to get Him to do it, but it is not that frustrating, frenetic activity of our minds that we involve ourselves in. It's similar with uh, another thing that God does for us. It's in Romans 8 and verse 13. Romans 8 and verse 13. It confer, uh, concerns the trouble we have keeping our temper, the trouble we have being critical with other people, the trouble we have with evil thoughts, that whole realm of the good that I would I cannot do, that whole area. Romans 8 and 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, see, by God's Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Many of us read that, but we don't really believe in the Spirit of God. We don't really believe in the Holy Spirit. And we know very little about our own spirits. And so we believe, well, what the Bible is saying is, if you put to death the things that are wrong in you by, well, by your own willpower. And so many of us involve ourselves in all kinds of repression in regard to evil thoughts, in regard to un unclean imaginations, in regard to criticizing other people, we resort to repression and at times suppression in order to get rid of these things. But do you see, we're exercising the will, the soul, in order to do something that God's dear word says we can only do by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit alone can bring us victory in those things. But many of us don't take the Holy Spirit too seriously in our lives. And we don't know much about the difference between our own spirits and our souls. And so we try to live in victory by the power of our own wills or by the power of our own minds. And you know how many books even there are today in the bookstores that talk about Renew the mind, and that's the way to get victory over unclean thoughts. There is a renewing of the mind to be done, but that itself is not the way into deliverance over unclean thoughts. The way into deliverance is the Holy Spirit. He alone can keep your own spirit clean, and therefore will keep your mind and your emotions clean. Just ask you to look at one more, loved ones, that is something we face uh, who spend 
a lot of time in the business world or in a secular realm of any kind. And it's Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, that is a description of spiritual warfare. But many of us know nothing of trusting the Holy Spirit in our office. And so our office is a place with a lot of swearing and a lot of criticism and a lot of uncleanness. But we know nothing of trusting the Holy Spirit to work in the spirits of our colleagues. And so we see spiritual warfare as a mental gymnastic. And we come in and we think being prayed up is feeling you could just take the whole office and throw it anywhere you want it. And it's a feeling that whatever they say, I can say something better. And then somebody does say something, and we exercise not our spirits, but our minds. We exercise our minds against that person. Lord, stop him saying that. Stop him saying that. And it isn't long after an hour or two of that before we are absolutely worn out like wet rags. We are washed out because we're trying to fight spiritual warfare by the exercise of our minds and emotions. Now, loved ones, those are some of the things we get into if we don't recognize the difference between spirit, our own spirit, and our souls. And if we don't recognize the ability of the Holy Spirit of God to change our spirits and to influence them and to strengthen them. And really, that's the secret of it all, you know. The secret is that the Holy Spirit alone can touch your spirit. You cannot touch your spirit. All you can do is fulfill the conditions which will permit the Holy Spirit to touch your spirit. But you yourself cannot. Many of us, because we don't recognize the difference between soul and spirit, we come to meetings like this and we go home with loads and loads of notes, both on paper and in our minds. And we're always trying to apply what this speaker said and what that book said. And there's very little rest in our lives, very little relaxation in Jesus. Because, of course, we know little of the Holy Spirit working in our spirits. Now, loved ones, the truth is that he is the only one can do it. The Holy Spirit alone can touch your spirit. Of course, the tragedy in the fall was that our spirits died. You know that. That's what happens. Our spirits died. The, one of the ways I tried to see it in my own mind was, you know when you have a, a friend and there's a kind of uh, conflict comes up between you and it's never really settled and you feel resentment towards them, you know that it effectively prevents you feeling any empathy with them. It's as if you can't get through. It's as if, even if it's husband or wife or brother and brother or brother and sister, it's as if this resentment has brought a blindness so that you can't sense them anymore. You can't feel what they're feeling. It's as if there's a great barrier between you. Now, it seems that that's what happened when we rebelled against God and determined to live our own lives. It seems, you know, that there was an insensitivity to God that came in that prevents us knowing him. I don't know if you have learned to appreciate anything in your life that you didn't appreciate before. I know that I had no time for classical music at all until eventually I got used to the bit that uh, uh, Churchill also always used to play before his speeches, and that was part of Beethoven's fifth. 
and I kept on listening to Beethoven's Fifth, and then I liked the quietness of old Chopin and his preludes and his etude, and I got to understand that a little. And then I got a little further into opera, and now there's a whole side of classical music that I really enjoy. Now, I didn't know it before. You know, it was as if it was all there, but I couldn't sense it, or I couldn't appreciate it, or I couldn't understand it. And I don't know if you have experiences like that. Maybe it's food with you, and I can think of some food that I just did not appreciate at all before. But gradually, you develop a sensitivity to the thing, and you begin to understand it. Now, it seems that that's what it's like with us. Our spirits, because we're living independent of God, are dead to him. They aren't sensitive to him. They can't understand him. Now, notice, it's not that they're dead to everything. Uh, when, when Wordsworth says, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the blue sky and the round ocean and in the mind of man. When he says that kind of thing in the midst of the Lake District in England, his spirit is somehow contacting what the Bible calls the elemental spirits of the universe. And you see, there is a spirit behind the universe besides the Holy Spirit of God. There are spirits that are connected with the evil spirit, Satan, who rebelled against God. And there are many spirits, human spirits, that are dead to God but are alive to these elemental spirits of the universe. I think that's what you're contacting when you deal with a spiritualist or a fortune teller. In fact, that's what you're dealing, I think, when you're dealing with loved ones in the Mormon church who have really submitted themselves utterly to it. You're not dealing with someone who is just misled mentally and intellectually. You're dealing with someone who has willfully followed an alternative to the plain presentation of the way that Jesus gives. And so, with people like that, you're contacting the elemental spirits of the universe. But our spirits are dead to God's spirit. That is, they don't sense what he wants us to do. Now, loved ones, that's the situation when the Bible says we're dead in our sins. It means not we're physically dead, though we will eventually be physically dead, but it means we're dead towards God. Doesn't even mean that your spirit is absolutely destroyed. Your spirit is in some sense alive because conscience is one function of your spirit. And most of us, however far we are from God, have some awareness of conscience. So most of us have a little, little sense of our spirits being alive inside. But the majority of us, that's all we have. We're really insensitive to God. That's why we have such trouble sensing what he wants us to do, you see. Because we have died in our spirit sensitivity to him. And so we're left with our souls and our bodies. And most of us live that way. Most of us live by the dictate of our bodies, actually. Most of us are just funny little animals, just little dogs and monkeys and birds and cows. That's what we are. Oh, we need more food so we get a better job so that we can buy better food. Oh, we need better clothing for the winter so we're dominated by the need to get money for better clothing. Or we have a nice home, but we'd not like a better shelter to keep us out of the rain more comfortably. And most people in the world run their lives by the domination of their bodies, not by the spirits which are utterly dead. Some of us, especially those of us who have been involved maybe in some education, are, uh, feel that we're a little above that, and we run our lives according to whether we're very mental, intellectual people, or whether we're very emotional people. And so some of us are utterly dominated by our emotions. We are. We go places where we will enjoy things. And that's the first question we ask ourselves, are we going to enjoy this? Well, then we'll go. And if we're not going to enjoy it, we won't go. And if we don't enjoy it, we don't think it's good. And if we do enjoy it, we think it's great. 
And many of us are utterly dominated by our emotions. And we know that because we're up and down, up and down all the time, according to whether we're in a happy situation or sad situation. And indeed, let us think of one unpleasant thing that is going, up to, uh, going to come up tomorrow, and we just are down in despair. We're so utterly dominated by our emotions. Some of us are very mental or intellectual people. We're coldly intellectual, and we calculate everything according to what our mind thinks is wise to do. And we leave very little room for kindness or tenderness with other people. And in fact, many of us are utterly repelled by the view we get of ourselves, because we find we're always trying to manipulate others with our minds. I don't know if you've ever wakened up some day and realized, oh, how I manipulate people, how I'm always trying to work things to my advantage, how every situation I go into, I try to ask myself, what's in this for me? Well, many of us, you see, are utterly dominated by our bodies and our souls in some way. Many of us are very strong will people. We're just will. We just enjoy willing doesn't matter what it is the result, we just enjoy exercising our will. And we spend uh, most of our time getting our own way in situations. We find it's ridiculous, of course, because we'll at times oppose somebody and we'll at times agree with somebody who thought the same thing as that other person. And we just exercise our wills against one person and for another person just because we want to exercise our wills. In fact, we object just because we want to be objectionable. And many of us are dominated by our minds, our emotions, or our wills, or our bodies. Now, loved ones, that's because our spirits are dead to God. And the only way for our spirits to come alive is if the Holy Spirit sensitizes them again to God. Now, there's no other way. I think it's really important for you to grasp that, you know, that there is no external thing can make your spirit alive to God. There isn't. There just isn't. And there's no external thing can keep your spirit alive to God. There isn't. That's one of the great relaxing, relieving things about becoming a child of God. It is all God's work. Only the Holy Spirit can make your spirit alive to God. No one else can. Only the Holy Spirit. Now, it might be good, you know, just to, to look at that because... I think many of us accept it, but really it isn't nailed into our hearts and our heads. And maybe it's good to look at it in the most obvious form in John 3 and verse 6. John 3 and verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And when... You become a child of God, the Holy Spirit regenerates your own spirit. Now you may say, well, uh, when will he do that? Well, it's, it's a very definite transaction, loved ones. And I'll just run through it very quickly, and, and then I think you'll see it very plainly. That's the kind of outline that we've often shared, as you remember, about our own psychological makeup. And I usually can get it on there, loved ones, but I, I really don't know, Greg, what I'm... Oh, good. Thank you. And of course, the will of God was, you see, that the Holy Spirit in him would come into us, you see, like that. And that's the way our whole personality would function. The Holy Spirit would come into us through the communion that we'd have with God, 
would tell us what to do through the intuition of our spirits. Our conscience then would constrain our wills in the light of what God was showing us we should do in the intuition of our spirits. Our conscience would constrain our wills to obey the conscience. And the will would direct the mind that would then understand in mental detail what God was saying, would give the right directions to the body, and the emotions would express that joy, the joy of our communion with God. And that was the way God wanted us to work. We, of course, did not want to operate that way. We rebelled against God and cut ourselves off from His Spirit so that our spirit died. And we, in fact, began to live, as I was sharing a little earlier, some of us by our emotions, some of us by our minds. And above all, the will, instead of obeying the conscience and directing the mind and emotions, began to obey the mind and emotions. So God would tell us, I want you to be a carpenter, but the mind would look around and see, well, no, other people make more money than carpenters. So the will would be dominated by the mind. Or the Holy Spirit would tell us, uh, you ought to seek God this morning. But the emotions would feel depressed and would say, oh, I can't. I don't feel like it. And so the will was utterly dominated by the mind and emotions instead of being in its previous planned position where it would rule those. And of course, what happened was our spirits died and we were cut off from God. Now, the tragedy is, that our souls themselves are now in a state of perversion. You can see that. I mean, you know it yourself. When you try to get your mind just to understand what God is telling you, you find your mind is doing the old business of trying to manipulate. If you find that, if you find yourself manipulating, your mind starts manipulating again. You're, you're trying with all your heart to care most what God wants, but your old mind is manipulating again for your own advantage. And uh, I wonder how often you find yourself in the spot I find myself. I want to give joy to other people, and I find myself wanting to enjoy, you know, get joy. And so the tragedy is that our souls now have become perverted. And our whole personality, therefore, is not working the way it was meant to at all. Many of us try to exercise our wills. We sense God wants us to do something. We try.